the afternoon session, we have Dr. Justin Paul with us to give us a talk on pulmonary hypertension. He is a professor of cardiology, MMC, and government super specialty ho hospital, Omanandur, and an interventional cardiologist in Apollo Hospital. He is an excellent teacher and a clinician. I now hand over the dais to Dr. Justin Paul. Uh, good afternoon, one and all of you. Thank you, ma'am, for the nice words. So, I think I should thank Dr. Gaurishankar for having invited me to enter IIT, which I could not enter after my 12th standard. Now I can go home and say that I gave an invited lecture in IIT. So, thank you, Gaurishankar. Uh, am I am not audible? Okay. So, this was the plan that I had about three days back that I will uh, talk to you about the anatomy, physiology and all these things for 15 days, investigations for 15 days and diagnostic evaluation for 15 days, 15 minutes and subsequently Q&A for 15 minutes. Uh, they say man proposes and God disposes. In my case, it is football that dis disposed and my son had an injury and I was a bit side till uh, half an hour back. I came from the post-operative ward, so I just could manage to browse some of these things, but I'm sure we'll do something useful. Uh, <clears throat> I was just browsing through the sessions that you had in the morning, and uh, Ramakrishnan was here teaching you about uh, all the theory which you want to practice now, you are free to do so, on sleep, and uh, only thing, don't snore. So now coming to uh, the pulmonary uh, uh, hypertension, a little bit about the anatomy. The lungs are unique that they have double blood supply. One is in the pulmonary arteries, other one is in the bronchial arteries, which could be two or three in number. The very purpose of the bronchial arteries is uh, for the nourishment of the airways. And similarly, the pulmonary venous drainage as well. You have uh, you know, two drainage. The main thing is the pulmonary veins, which are connected to the left atrium, and the bronchial veins. Now, bronchial veins are basically not pulmonary veins, they are not getting oxygenated blood. They are supplying the <coughs> airways and as a result they take the deoxygenated blood and they enter into the left atrium, pulmonary veins. So as a result it is a physiological right to left shunting. If you look at this picture, this is a very unique uh, uh, picture that uh, has been created in our lungs. This is the acinus or the terminal alveoli and you have the pulmonary arteriole and the pulmonary venule and this is the place where the air exchange takes place. The size of the venules and the capillaries rather that is over the acinus is so small that only one RBC can cross a venule at a time. So if you look at that amazing thing RBCs get lined up one by one, one after another to get oxygenated and they go back. So now, <clears throat> whenever there is a distortion of this uh, function for some reason, uh, you have a pulmonary hypertension setting in the basic seats are sown. Now, pulmonary circulation is unique in the sense, unlike the systemic circulation, which has a higher resistance and a lower capacitance, this has a very large capacitance. It can accommodate large increases in cardiac output without increases in pressure. And the resistance of pulmonary vascular uh, circulation is only one fifteenth of the systemic vascular uh, resistance. So as a result, you know, you can, like in a left-right shunts, you can have three times the pulmonary blood flow without much increase in. Uh, PA pressure, you can have a large ASD with a left right shunt 3 is to 1, but still a normal PA pressure. That is because of its ability to accommodate uh, the blood flow. Uh, a brief uh, visit into your uh, school's Ohm's law. If you remember, voltage is equal to current into resistance. Restated it applies this way. If you apply this to pulmonic circulation, trans pulmonary gradient that is the driving pressure that drives the blood across the pulmonary circulation. There is a mean pulmonary artery pressure minus the left atrial pressure which is surrogated by pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be a equivalent to 
pulmonary blood flow into pulmonary vascular resistance the same ohms law but however this predicts the changes in pulmonary vascular resistance only when there is more than four times increase in normal pulmonary blood flow till then the lung compensates by recruitment to compare the pulmonic circulation and systemic circulation side by side you see the <coughs> mean pulmonary pressure is only 15 whereas mean arterial pressure is 90 the pulmonary capillary pressure is only 7 systemic capillary pressure is 17 the pulmonary venous pressure is only 2 whereas systemic uh, venous pressure the RA pressure is around 6 whereas the blood flow is the same pulmonary blood flow and the systemic blood flow will be the same in the absence of a shunting now coming to pathophysiology of uh, pulmonary hypertension these four are the primary issues responsible for pulmonary hypertension there are various vasoconstrictors operating there <coughs> thromboxane A2 endothelin 1 leukotrienes platelet activating factor in addition to vasoconstriction they also are uh, pro multiplying factors and you have vasodilators this complex interplay when it favors the vasoconstrictors it can trigger pulmonary hypertension and again the interplay between the procoagulants and the anticoagulants when it favors the procoagulants it can lead to thrombosis and the growth factors can lead to proliferation and these factors can trigger off inflammation and all these put together <coughs> we have pulmonary hypertension this is what I just told you the main uh, dilators are prostacycline and nitric oxide and the main constrictor is uh, endothelin and <coughs> the net result we have these are the changes that uh, develop if you look at this is the normal uh, pulmonary uh, vessel artery and this is the lumina and this is the media if you look here what happens in pulmonary hypertension is severe intimal proliferation here is an example of severe medial hypertrophy and you can have in situ thrombosis and plexiform lesions this is another expression of the same thing you have plexiform lesions and medial hypertrophy and uh, intimal thickening these are all the basic pathology of uh, pulmonary hypertension you can call it a panvasculopathy not only the intima but also the media and the adventitia uh, are affected to summarize there is a significant vascular remodeling the panvasculopathy it becomes uh, from what it was a high flow low resistance circulation it gets converted into a low flow high resistance circulation and that is the essential pathophysiologic uh, basis of pulmonary hypertension you have this plexiform lesions you have in situ thrombosis you have proliferations you can have one or two or more occurring in the same patient and right ventricle starts compensating for that to start with as you can see this is the normal appearing right ventricle where the interventricular septum is bulging into the right ventricle and as the PA pressure increases the right ventricle uh, wall thickness increases to compensate for the generation of higher PA pressure the endothelium gets thickened and the cardiac output is normal but there is increase in pulmonary vascular resistance when the RV fails you can find out thinning and as a result RA pressure and RV and diastolic pressure going up so now coming to the definition of what the disease that we are dealing with now an increase in mean pulmonary artery pressure we have the you know uh, systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure the mean pressure when the mean pressure is more than 25 millimeters at rest or more than 30 millimeters at uh, with the exercise we call it uh, the pulmonary hypertension is present or if there is an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance by more than 300 dynes second per cm squared or three wood units named after Paul Wood the famous, card, famous cardiologist actually one wood unit is only 80 dynes per second but there is some variation it could be some uh, studies they take more than 240 some studies they take more than 300 dynes second per centimeter to the power of five and uh, now looking at the pathophysiological types of pulmonary hypertension is good for you to know uh, how many of your postgraduates can I see your hands up if you don't mind okay fine thank you so uh, you need to know all uh, the pathophysiological types of pulmonary hypertension we have one is called the pre-capillary hypertension other one is called the post-capillary hypertension 
Now, for uh, our understanding, uh, section the heart into the left side and the right side and interpose the lung in the middle. You find the SVC, right atrium, right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, it goes into the pulmonary arteriole, pulmonary capillaries, the sinus, the pulmonary venules, pulmonary veins, left atrium, the left ventricle. Now, this is the pulmonary capillary area. Any cause of pulmonary hypertension that operates at this level and before, we call it pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. Anything that operates at this level here, responsible for hypertension, we call it post-capillary hypertension. Now, how do we identify whether there is a pre-capillary hypertension or a post-capillary hypertension? The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure helps us to understand. It is basically a surrogate of the LA pressure. When say for example, there is a mitral stenosis, the LA pressure goes up. Or when there is a severe left heart failure, the LV endiastolic pressure goes up and as a result LA pressure goes up. Now how do you measure the LA pressure? You can't take the balloon inside. The only way will be to practically measure is what we do during balloon mitral. We puncture the interatal septum, enter the left atrium, measure the LA pressure directly. But you don't have to do that invasive procedure routinely. You take a catheter with the balloon in the tip and advance it into the distal pulmonary artery and inflate the balloon. There is a catheter in the tip with a pressure transducer here. It measures the pressure in this segment. Now, when there is no flow here, whatever is measured here is indirectly reflecting whatever is measured here. So, it is basically a surrogate of the LA pressure. So, LA pressure is measuring by pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Whenever the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is more than 15, you call it a post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. And when it is less than 15, you call it a pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. And in post-capillary hypertension, you can have two other subtypes. You would have heard during the <coughs> explanation of pulmonary hypertension, mitral stenosis. Whether there is a passive pulmonary hypertension or a reactive pulmonary hypertension. When we say passive, it is just a passive transmission of the pressure this side to that side. Now, as I told you, the transpulmonary gradient is a driving pressure head that drives the blood from here to here, from the pulmonary artery to the left atrium. Now, this is the transpulmonary gradient. Normally, there should be a gradient of less than 10 millimeters of mercury between this and this. Now, if you have uh, <coughs> post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, say uh, the LA pressure is uh, 30 in a severe mitral stenosis and the PA pressure here, mean pressure is 38. That means that 38 minus 30, you have the driving pressure is only 10, 8, less than 10. So, it is just a passive pulmonary hypertension when the transpulmonary gradient is less than 10. You take another scenario, when the same LA pressure is 30 here and the PA mean pressure measured here is 55. So, it is not just the transmission passively of the pressure, it also is a reaction of the system here. So, we call it a reactive pulmonary hypertension. This passive and the reactive we usually talk in terms of post capillary pulmonary hypertension. So, Coming to the classification of pulmonary hypertension, you would have heard so many varieties of classifications. We just talked about the pathophysiological classification and in your pathology you would have studied about the pathological classification, Heath Edwards, not to speak of the Rabinovic classification as well. Then you have the clinical classifications and you would have had the functional classifications. We will have very brief touch upon this and in the end I will just tell you what you need to remember. So, Heath Edwards classification, you know, you would all studied in your pathology. It is good to remember that once again, the medial hypertrophy, intimal hyperplasia, occlusive changes, dilatations and plexiform lesions and necrotizing arthritis. Now, one can progress from 1 to 6 or 2 to 4. He does not have to follow this order. You can have 2 and 6 happening in the same patients. It can be uh, mixed. And Coming to the clinical classification of pulmonary hypertension, they, all of you would have heard the term primary pulmonary hypertension, but actually as per the recommendations, it should be an obsolete term, but still, uh, you know, when Dresdale first used it in 1951, still it is well ingrained in the literature 
even many journals they come out of the term primary pulmonary hypertension. This classification was primarily proposed when the first international conference on primary pulmonary hypertension was conducted in 1973. They classified as primary and secondary which however is uh, uh, removed now. Subsequently we have had three classifications. Many of you would have had called EVN classification, some book mentioned about Venice classification, some books mentioned about Danapoin classification. Do not get confused, they are basically the names of the places where these symposia were held. In the second symposia, they changed from two, that is primary and secondary to five subcategories, which is consistently maintained till Danapoin classification. So as postgraduate, it is enough if you need to know the latest, which is the Danapoin classification. So it classifies the pulmonary hypertension to five categories. One is called the pulmonary arterial hypertension, which includes the idiopathic, heritable, and uh, these conditions associated with pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary vena occlusive disease. The other thing is anything related to the left heart producing pulmonary hypertension is called group 2. Sometimes we term as group 2 pulmonary hypertension. Anything related to the lung producing pulmonary hypertension is group 3. And Chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is group 4 and multifactorial is group 5. These five categories are consistently maintained second, third and fourth international pulmonary hypertension classifications. To summary if, uh, for you to understand, this is enough if you know these five. This is a summary of the Danapoin classification and each one has been given sub numbers which uh, you may find it difficult to remember, you need not remember. And Taking this point once again, this is the point where pulmonary arterial hypertension, this is a group 2 and this is the area of the group 3 and this is the area of the group 4 and miscellaneous. And the last classification that you need to know in terms of treatment is uh, functional classification of pulmonary hypertension. Other thing you also need to know is uh, all these uh, classifications which I mentioned are all approved by WHO. So many times you find out, uh, find in the books mentioned as WHO classification. They all uh, were well at, were approved by WHO, so you may find WHO classification of Dana point, they are one and the same. But WHO has come out with another classification, primarily functional classification, that is for deciding what kind of medicines that you want to give for the uh, patient. So this is nothing but NOHA classification all of you are familiar with, which is little slightly modified by uh, WHO, you do not need to know all these things, only thing you need to know there is class 1 to class 4 which is almost similar to NOHA classification. Most of the drugs that we advocate are uh, advocated according to the cla uh, functional classification. So it is enough if you know there is something called pre and post capillary hypertension, there is something called passive and reactive, you need to know this thing, you need to know there is something called Heath Edwards, there is something called the last uh, clinical classification and the functional classification. Now coming to the symptoms of pulmonary hypertension, dyspnea is the most common symptom of pulmonary hypertension. This is from the NIH registry where they found as they were trying to enroll patients with pulmonary hypertension, about 60 percent of them had dyspnea. Once they found that the patients, uh, they diagnosed pulmonary hypertension, then they found more 98 percent had dyspnea as a uh, presenting uh, symptom. Any patient with dyspnea, you definitely will have to consider pulmonary hypertension. Now dyspnea is due to many mechanisms all of you will be aware of in uh, <coughs> PP, pulmonary hypertension is primarily due to pulmonary artery stretch receptors and as a compensation for arterial hypoxemia. And uh, this is the Indian study data and this is the NIH registry. Again syncope is uh, due to the fixed cardiac output because the pulmonary artery cannot, uh, the uh, hypertension cannot increase the cardiac output the need for exercise. Uh, in terms times of exercise, there is uh, inability to increase the cardiac output and the cardiac output falls. Syncope may be a reason, arrhythmia may be a reason for syncope. And chest pain of a non-specific, it could be due to right ventricular ischemia. And an uh, interesting case we had had was uh, a patient with a typical angina and we did a coronary angiogram, he had a significant constriction of the left main coronary artery. Now left main coronary artery significant constriction, only thing is it has an extrinsic compression. So we did a CT angio, it was a dilated pulmonary artery sitting on the left main coronary artery and the left main coronary artery was compressed. So we had to put in a very thick strength, a strength with a good radial strength in that place and the symptom improved. 
but uh, we need to know that this also can be a reason for typical angenal chest pain in pulmonary hypertension. And fatigue again uh, could be due to low cardiac output. So basically the symptomatology is due to either elevated RA pressure, elevated PA pressure or <coughs> reduced cardiac index. Other symptoms could be palpitations, outness syndrome uh, and all these things. And as the disease progresses, the symptoms progress. Coming to the clinical features, it is very important for you to know that pulmonary hypertension is a condition with lot of clinical findings. Starting from say if you look at the neck veins, you can have a prominent A wave. If there is a TR, you can have a V wave. When the patient goes in for right heart failure, the V wave can be very much prominent, JVP may be elevated. The lungs are generally very clear unless it is a pulmonary hypertension due to a lung disease, the group 3. And precardium, you can have a left parastinal lift which will be grading 1 to 3 and you can have an epigastric pulsations, you can have a pulsation in the pulmonary artery, you can have a palpable uh, pulmonary closure felt, <clears throat> you can have a dullness on percussion which you call as a Gerhardt's dullness. If the patient has in heart failure, you can have a peripheral edema. So as I told you, the PA pressure, increased PA pressure causes palpable P2 left parasitic lift, RA pressure causes a prominent A wave and low cardiac index can produce peripheral cyanosis, cold limbs. And if the RA, RV fails, you can have a pulsatile liver as well. Now coming to the clinical signs, the auscultatory signs, many times what are the findings of pulmonary Students tend to blurt out only the auscultatory signs. Always go from the pulse, BP, JVP and precordial palpation and then coming to the auscultation. I think Perloff mentions um, four sounds, uh, f five sounds and four murmurs in pulmonary hypertension. You can have an ejection click in pulmonary hypertension. You can have a fourth heart sound, RVS4. And when the RV fails, you can have a RV third heart sound. So an ejection click, a fourth heart sound, the RV fail, there is an RV third heart sound. And you have a sh closely spread second heart sound. Second heart sound is generally closely spread. It is a moving but closely spread second heart sound and P2 is loud. These are the sounds that you hear in the pulmonary hypertension. Coming to the murmurs, you can have two systolic murmurs. One systolic murmur could be due to a dilated pulmonary artery and the turbulence producing a very short systolic, mid systolic murmur. Other thing it could be a tricuspid regurgitation producing a pan systolic murmur which typically increases on deep breathing or increases with leg elevation which you call as a carvalho sign. And the murmurs you can have a early diastolic murmur which you call as a Graham steel murmur. And as a Graham steel similarly you can also produce a right sided Austin Flint murmur across the tricuspid valve which could be due to either summation of S4 and S3 or due to the same mechanism operating on the left side, uh, the TR, uh, PR jet producing a uh, mixing of the flow producing a mid diastolic murmur which you call the right sided Austin flint. So you, you can have four sound, five sounds and four murmurs, nine auscultatory signs in pulmonary hypertension. Good for you postgraduates to know when what are the auscultatory signs of pulmonary hypertension you classify and say you can have four sounds and uh, five sounds and four murmurs. And also you need to look at the other clinical features which can give us an idea as to what are the clues to the etiology. If you have a central cyanosis, you can consider intrapulmonary shunting. Uh, even a pulmonary AV fistula, as I told you, the one of the mechanisms of pulmonary AV fistula is the pulmonary capillary is becoming larger. When they become larger, they can't go one by one in the line. So they don't get oxygenated adequately, it produces a physiological right or left shunt. There is a clubbing, it suggests a pulmonary venopathy or congenital heart disease, other systolic murmurs help you and obesity and kyphoscoliosis, they themselves can be a reason for hypertension. So these are some of the physical signs that help you to identify the causes of pulmonary hypertension. So the, what are the investigations you are going to do? ECG is a common investigation that we routinely do and many times it gives us a pointer as to the cause of uh, the presence of pulmonary hypertension. If you look at the generally sinusitum is the rule. You do not get pulmonary hypertension and atrial fibrillation. The reason being the presence of AF is very poorly tolerated. 
because it needs the atrial kick so much to have the cardiac output moving forward. When the patient develops atrial uh, fibrillation many a times the patient goes in for sudden death and that probably is the reason why we do not get the, to see the patients with pulmonary hypertension and atrial fibrillation. The right atrium is enlarged and you can see P pulmonal here and you can uh, tall P waves in the elite 2 and tall uh, positive complexes in V1 even you can have a you know P terminal force in V1 but however the duration of the P terminal force in V1 will not be broad unlike a LAP wave. This is generally a RAP wave where you find the P terminal force is not wide and in the R wave in V1 uh, it can QRS in V1 can be a monophasic R like what you see here or you can a tall R and S complex or an R as R dash complex where the R dash will be taller than the R and you can see there is a right axis deviation. So the right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy and right atrial enlargement are present in about 70 to 80 percent of the patients with pulmonary hypertension. And you can also have what you call as a S1, S2, S3 syndrome they say like you know all the three waves having S1, S2, S3 means lead 1, lead 2, lead 3 all having uh, good S waves. They do not have very good S waves, it almost uh, for me first day of S1, S2, S3 happening here. And in case of a pulmonary embolism you can have a S1 Q3 T3 pattern as well and chest x-ray you find a central pulmonary arteries very much enlarged. You need to measure the which pulmonary artery you will be measuring right descending pulmonary artery is the measuring uh, me uh, is used to measure and identify the presence or absence of pulmonary hypertension. But uh, in uh, these absolute values like 13.5 they do not apply in digital x-rays because they are all miniaturized x-rays. Nowadays we always get a digital x-ray so you cannot use the absolute criteria to assess the presence or absence of pulmonary hypertension in a miniaturized x-ray. You can have the central pulmonary artery is dilated here, RPA dilated here. Many a times there is not much of cardiomegaly unless there is a right heart failure. Sometimes unless we are careful we may dismiss this x-ray as normal. And as you can see the peripheries of the lungs you do not see much of vascular markings. You can even see the peripheral pulmonary arteries are getting narrowed down which we call it as a peripheral pruning. This is a lateral view that shows the RV is also enlarged here. This is another patient with pulmonary hypertension unlike the previous patient where you find there is cardiomegaly. This patient is going for decompensation. You can see that uh, the impression of the inferior vena cava is seen here. So in some time if you see very carefully you can see one line going here there is a dilated SVC. If you see the chest x-ray you can say that JVP will be elevated. The examiner would have seen this chest x-ray he may not have seen the patient. If you go and present JVP is normal he will know that you know you are wrong because you know you will find it out from here that SVC shadows prominence obviously JVP has to be elevated and the PA segments are prominent you can have a RA enlargement here. The other thing that uh, really helps us to assess and quantify is the echocardiography. Nowadays echocardiography is available as such a small thing that we can have it in the pocket. In our department we have a pocket sized echo probe that we can put it really inside the pocket wherever you want you can just keep it and do the echocardiogram. So it helps us to identify there is the normally this is the four chamber view left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle you see the RA and RV are dilated. It not only helps us to identify and quantify the pulmonary hypertension but also helps us to assess the etiological factors and the associated complications. This what we call as a short axis view you find the RV is grossly dilated. Here fourth chamber view RV and RA are dilated. This is not how generally it looks like. In fact the LA and LV are larger than the RA and RV. And we use the Doppler mechanism to identify the pressure. You can using Doppler you can find the pressure difference. See if you can mind find the pressure difference of this, this is a tricuspid regurgitation, right ventricle and right atrium, TR goes like this. If you interrogate and find out what is the velocity of this thing and find the gradient across this, you know this is the TR pressure gradient. TR pressure gradient is a result of right ventricular systolic pressure pushing it against the right atrial pressure. So RA RV systolic pressure minus right atrial pressure will be the TR pressure gradient and you have the TR pressure gradient your echo machine will give you the TR pressure gradient. So RA pressure if the JVP is not elevated you can assume as 5. 
the JVP is elevated, you can make it 10 or 15 as the case may be. So you uh, know what is the RV systolic pressure. You can bedside say the patient is mild or moderate or severe pulmonary hypertension by doing an echo. In the same way you can also get by pulmonary regurgitation jet interrogation. Uh, and LV diastolic dysfunction can be identified. This is a very common phenomena uh, responsible for pulmonary hypertension. You can have LV diastolic dysfunction in older people or in patients with hypertension. Other thing in patients with coronary artery disease. In some patients with coronary artery disease, they may not come to you with any angina. They may just come to you with dyspnea and you may find pulmonary hypertension. And in these patients, uh, these various uh, indices for diastolic dysfunction can be used. And when you do a coronary angiogram, we find significant coronary artery disease. Pulmonary hypertension, in fact, could be a pointer towards the presence of uh, coronary artery disease in a patient where you don't get any other reason for pulmonary hypertension. Uh, this is an example of lung scintigraphy where you find this is the uh, air, how much of uh, ventilation scan and this is a perfusion scan. Here you find in this area and this area what is ventilated is not perfused here and what is ventilated here is not perfused here. So you know there is a segmental deficit in this area, there is a thrombus occluding the vessel. And contrast enhanced CT chest again helps us almost diagnostic of the thromboembolism. This is what we call as a mosaic pattern because of uh, the variable attenuation seen here. And sometimes you can really visualize the thrombus. A CT pulmonary angiogram, this we did two months back in a patient who came to us. You can see uh, the blood flow from the main pulmonary artery dividing into the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery here. It is uh, the thrombus that is blocking it. We lies this patient though he improved. And MRI is another important, uh, you know, uh, sc screening, uh, not screening, it is a, a tool that is helping us in quantifying uh, the pulmonary hypertension because RV function by echo, we do not really have very good indices to measure it whereas in MRI you can measure the RV ejection fraction, RV volumes and cardiac index. So a lot of studies have come out and they found that they have very high degree of accuracy and reproducibility in measuring the RV function. And pulmonary artery stiffness is another index uh, using MRI. So biomarkers again you can whatever we are using for heart failure. The, the same uh, biomarkers BNP and NT pro BNP, they have been found to be independent predictors of mortality and survival in pulmonary hypertension. Even cardiac troponin T has been found to be a survival marker and uh, elevated cardiac troponin T indicates a poor prognosis. This most of the time they are used in follow up of the patients, I am just summarizing the investigations here. Uh, and the six minutes walk test is something that all of us can practically plan in your hospital, in your clinic, wherever you want. The advantage is it is very simple, it is very inexpensive, reproducible, well standardized. You allow the patient to walk for six minutes and measure what is the distance. If you measure the distance in your veranda or in your lobby, you know this is 50 meters. If he walks it five times in six minutes, you know he can walk only 250 meters. So walking distance less than 250 indicates an impact prognosis and desaturation again indicates a poor prognosis. And other thing is right heart catheterization. It is a gold standard and confirms the diagnosis, assess the severity, helps us to assess the prognosis, helps us to exclude the left side of diseases and we can rule out the left right shunts. And the most importantly, the acute vasodilator challenge which need not be done with the cardiac catheterization which can be done in the ICU also by a bedside uh, flotation catheter. So these are the ESC recommendations as to what are the indications for cardiac catheterization. They and the component, we generally measure all the pressures, RA pressure, RV pressure, all the oxygen saturations here. and. Uh, the response to the acute vasodilator that is what we are really interested in in deciding of what kind of medicines that we can give for the patient. We can use an ICU or cath lab using a PA catheter, IV adenosine, inhale nitric oxide and IV epoprostenol. These are the commonly used though other things have been other agents have been used. 
So whenever there is a mean PA pressure more than 50 and a PVR more than 3 wood units, if you would like to know whether they, you can use a calcium channel blocker comfortably, you would like to know how to test for acute vasodilator. So the parameters measured are the mean pulmonary artery pressure. If there is a decrease in mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 10 millimeters of mercury, with the mean PA coming down less than 30, it means the patient will respond to vasodilators. If there is a more than one third decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance, or if the pulmonary vascular resistance come down less than six units, they respond well. In these patients, there should not be any change in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure during the testing. There should not be a, a drop in cardiac output. There can be an increase in cardiac output. There should not be a significant change in heart rate. When we are measuring this, we have to make sure that this uh, is, are maintained normal. And the systemic arterial saturation should either increase if it is low in room, room air or otherwise it should not be changed. So this is what a positive response as defined by all the guidelines. A mean PA pressure should fall by more than 40 millimeters and the absolute value of the PA pressure should be less than 40 millimeters of mercury. I'm sorry, mean PA pressure should fall more than 10 millimeters and the absolute value should reach less than 40 with either unchanged cardiac output. So this means this patient will respond to vasodilators. You can comfortably use calcium channel blockers which is rather inexpensive when compared to the other medicines available. So we have the two bodies, they generally don't agree on either side of Atlantic. We have the ACC AHA guidelines on one side and the ESC guidelines on one side. ACC guidelines too, I will just touch upon this thing, they have two kinds of tests, what we call the pivotal tests, which are necessary to identify and establish a diagnosis, it, whereas contingent tests accordingly, it may be used only performed in an appropriate scenario. You do not have to remember all that, these are the pivotal tests that the ACC recommends, well this all of you will be doing it up to this echocardiogram, subsequently PFT, overnight oximetry all can be done. And these are the contingent tests. This is again a stepwise approach. But I thought we'll just see the stepwise approach by the American College of Chest Physicians, which is more helpful, will be more helpful to you. So we'll see uh, how the ACCP approaches this. Is there a reason to any patient coming to you? Is there a reason to suspect pulmonary hypertension based on the clinical history or the chest x-ray or ECG? So if we look at the symptoms as we saw the symptoms or the signs and you can also screen the high risk populations for pulmonary hypertension or it could be an incidental finding. If nothing is there, no further evaluation is necessary. If you find something positive, if you suspect it is possibility that the patient may be having a pulmonary hypertension, then go for echocardiogram. Measure the RV systolic pressure, the RV size, the LV size, look for RV, RA enlargement an RV dysfunction. And if you find there is some reason in the left side, say for example the patient may be having LV systolic dysfunction, or the patient may be having LV diastolic dysfunction, or the patient may be having a valvular heart disease. If the patient has any of these things, you treat the patient accordingly. We need not give any lung uh, pulmonary hypertension specific therapy. And no further evaluation is necessary if the response is very well. If despite treatment the response is not good, we may have to go for further evaluation. And you have excluded uh, left heart disease by echo, then still it is always good to do an echo with contrast. The reason is some of the diseases like say a large ductus, patent ductus arteriosus, you may not be able to pick up by echo because of the severe pulmonary hypertension, there may not be any significant flow from the iota and the pulmonary artery. So in such patients, if you do a contrast echocardiogram, you can see the contrast flowing from the pulmonary artery to the iota and you realize uh, that uh, the patient has a ductus. So you still can do a contrast echocardiogram and any abnormal morphology, if there is any shunt which requires surgery or medical treatment, if you found out the reason, no further evaluation is necessary. If you still are uh, in dilemma, not sure what are we dealing with, and look whether there is any connective tissue disorders. About 1 to 2 percent of HIV patients have uh, pulmonary hypertension, which is quite significant without a definite uh, reason. See, so if you are ruling out 
scleroderma, I mean if you do not suspect scleroderma as SLE other connected disease or HIV and further evaluation, if you do not suspect you come down, if you suspect you go in that line and treat uh, the primary disorder. If you do not suspect, these are the tests, some of the tests that you can do to identify the presence or absence of these clinical conditions. Now, if you do not find any of these things, probably you should suspect a chronic pulmonary embolism. And if you suspect, do a pulmonary angiogram and the definitive treatment for chronic pulmonary thromboembolism is a surgery in a center which is trained for that. So, we are not supposed to try it new in any new center unless the person is experienced in, in operating on chronic pulmonary thromboembolism. So, now if you find it operable, go for thromboendoctectomy or medical therapy as appropriate. If not, if is it due to any lung disease? If you do not find any lung disease or anything, ultimately you come down to the idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. This is the uh, protocol recommended by the American College of Chest Physicians. This one slide uh, for you to know what is the recommendation of uh, American College, European Society of Cardiology, European Heart Journal and European Society of Cardiology. They just basically, the, remember the groups that we saw, five groups of done point classification. So, they basically try to exclude the second group and the third group. Straight away by non-invasive assessment, if they have a lung disease, they go here. If they have heart disease, they grow here. Now, you have group 2 or group 3 diagnosis confirmed, you treat appropriately. If you are not able to confirm, you have to go for the next level. If it is confirmed, but you still find out the pulmonary hypertension is inappropriate to the level of uh, level what you expect, you may have to go for a VQ scan. And these are the various other tests accordingly, you know, uh, target specific tests, uh, not the uh, contingent, non contingent tests. And finally, you land up after excluding all these things idiopathic or heritable pulmonary hypertension. Now, these are some of the uh, genetic uh, malformations that are identified in a heritable pulmonary artery disease. You can look for these things in the family, those are the family history of uh, pulmonary hypertension. A few words uh, about uh, natural history. Natural history is quite bleak and the median survival is only 2.8 years. Though, uh, you know, I have seen a VSD girl with severe pulmonary hypertension, Eisenmenger, we have catheterized her in 2000. In 2000, that time she was 8 years old, now she is a teacher in a school. She still is able to manage her routine. You know, the, when, well, well, one swallow does not make a summer, but still uh, the average survival is uh, 2.8. We do get swallows. Uh, number of the median survival for 5 years only 34 uh, percent. The prognosis hour is influenced by the underlying etiology. As I said, the shunts, they have a better prognosis. Scleroderma has a very worse prognosis. Patients with shunts have a better prognosis. This was one study which showed that patients with shunts lived longer, patients with the HIV lived shorter and this is the prognosis of 5 year survival of idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. And these are some of the, if you have a patient you need to know, the patient, you need really need to talk to the patients about the prognosis. I will tell you one mistake that I made about uh, 5, 6 years back, a patient I was referred to me from some far off village. He had a pulmonary hypertension, he came with his wife and two children. So, the family was so distraught as somebody had said that you know he is going to die soon. So, they were literally crying. So, I consoled and said them things are okay, do not worry, it will improve, we can do things better. So, we gave medicines, do not worry, come again. He did not come again, but he came after one and a half years with the one more child. So, you know I realized that I had not advised him. You know, I, I was basically encouraging him at that point, but then he got too much encouraged and came back with one more children. So, it is very important that we tell them that uh, the severe pulmonary hypertension, uh, women particularly uh, pregnancy is contraindicated, maternal mortality is very high up to 50 percent. And in men also, you know, if you have a survival only 5 years, what is the point in raising a child uh, without a father? So, well, uh, women I do not know whether they may agree or not, but then the, there is a big article in Time magazine that in US the fatherless children are the most delinquent, uh, the recent Time magazine article. Uh, now, uh, coming back to the topic, if the patient has a clinical evidence of RV failure, uh, the patient has a worse prognosis. They have a rapid progression of symptoms, they have worse prognosis. If they are present with symptom syncope, they have a worse prognosis. 
if the functional class is class for WHO functional class, please remember uh, we are not using NOHA functional class for pulmonary hypertension, though it uh, technically looks similar. And uh, these are some of the findings that show support prognosis. Treatment, I will not go uh, too much into it, we will just uh, browse it upon in 2 minutes and we will finish off. The goals of the therapy will be uh, to abolish the right heart failure, to improve the symptoms, when you say symptomatic improvement to increase the 6 minutes walk distance, peak exercise capacity in the functional uh, class and reverse the vascular remodeling. Now general measures you please remember this is something uh, you can, you have to encourage the patient to have a low grade aerobic exercise such as walking. They should be encouraged to walking and they should be advised against heavy physical activity and avoid exposure to high altitudes. If they are going for a high altitude, if they are going for a flight, make sure that they have a saturation of more than 92. Yes, all the time it is always good to maintain a saturation more than 90. If they have a saturation less than 92 and they come to you for a clearance for the flight, tell them that you know they need to take oxygen in flight uh, to maintain a saturation of more than 92 and ask them to avoid uh, deep valsalva manuvers and we pregnancy we touched upon already and cigarette smoking and other vasoconstrictors are to be avoided. You can encourage them to vaccinate themselves against flu and pneumo vaccination. So these general measures are extremely important. Uh, in US now we know pulmonary hypertension, I have pulmonary hypertension specialists. People are referred to pulmonary hypertension referral centers but then we do not have such centers here so it is necessary for us to know all these things. So these are the available therapies, diuretics, digitalis, warfarin and uh, this uh, the surgical aspects of it. In a specific therapy in patients with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, you have to anticoagulate unless they have a contraindication. The INR should be titrated to this level and diuretics are indicated when there is only RV volume oral. Otherwise, really you have to be very careful in giving diuretics. Supplemental oxygen I told you, in patients right heart failure, digoxin can be given. Coming to vasoactive agents, in patients in whom we have found that they respond very well to vasodilator testing you can give calcium blockers, you do not have to go down to the other, the other three drugs primarily are the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, endothelin receptor antagonists and prostenoids. And the phosphodiesterase inhibitors primarily they act by increasing this um, cyclic GMP by uh, uh, inhibiting this uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor specifically it acts only in the lung tissue as a result it does not have a systemic action and there is no hypotension. The, the, activity of the nitric oxide is facilitated by increasing the cyclic GMP. Sildenafil now tadalafil is also available in the market. And endothelin, these are the harmful effects of endothelin. So basically endothelin receptor antagonism is uh, going to help you in managing. So bosentan is an approved drug, approved two, two and a half, three years back. And now we have a ambricentan and this prostenoids. Basically they reduce the prostocycline synthesis. And the three commercial available prostenoids are hypoprostenol and uh, this is uh, by the subcutaneous pumps and trepanalyl and uh, iloprost by inhalation. Now if you look uh, at the available drugs, as we come down we increase in efficiency whereas come reduce in simplicity. These are all the oral drugs. You can use bosentan and ambricentan and be careful about the hepatotoxicity. It is indicated for NOHA class 2 to 4. Sildenafil however is, uh, sorry WHO, sildenafil is indicated even for WHO 1, 1 to 4. Eloprost, then treposinal and apoprostenol. This probably you can just uh, browse through as for the drug part of it as I told you. If they are vasoreactive you can use calcium channel blockers. If they are non-vasoreactive or if they are vasoreactive still they do not respond to calcium blockers you can use this thing. And if they are in uh, class 2, WHO functional class 2, you can use ambricentan, bosentan and sildenafil. These are class 1A, tenralafil is class 1B only. And functional class 3 you can use uh, all these drugs and class 4 IV hypoprostenol. So these are uh, some of the areas where these drugs are now approved, this is as per the 2009 guidelines. It is high time they need to be approved because updated because uh, we have lot of trials that have come out on Tadalafil and uh, Citacentan. So pulmonary hypertension is a scenario where it is not uh, one size fits in all uh, uh, scenario. 
you have different kinds of uh, pollen hypertension presenting with different scenario, different cause. You have to identify and treat the pollen hypertension. You have to identify the treatable causes like left heart disease or any connective tissue disorders or uh, lung pathology and appropriately treat. If not, you will have to choose the appropriate drug therapy. And I thank you for the patient listening in the post. Uh, generally, what they say is after lunch, the entire worldview of everybody changes. I am not sure what kind of worldview you were in. Most of you were uh, lying down. I don't know if they are sleeping or awake. If you were awake and if you had questions, I am <laughs> ready to answer them. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful presentation on pulmonary hypertension. There are no questions. I would like to thank Dr. Justin Paul. On thank behalf you, of Institute Hospital, we would like to give a small moment. Thank you, madam. Thank you.